Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Lifetime Value. I'm your host, Rithik. Today, for our third mystery guest, I have one of the most fascinating guests I've had on the podcast, Ricardo Chavez. Even though Ricardo is a classically trained physics major, having worked at the likes of CERN, he has decided to follow his passion for fashion photography and advertising, starting his company, Region Mas Transparente, sometime in 2015. He's currently also the founder of his advertising agency, CGTA, and has had exhibitions about the Mexican landscape and worked for Canadian production companies, international advertising agencies like the Screen Media Group Miami, Banana, and his works have been used by international brands such as Nestle, Grupo Bimbo, Hewlett Packard, and Glamour. Today, Ricardo is going to share his fascinating journey from the world of physics and data science to fashion photography, and he will explain how he's managed to apply his learnings from his days as a data scientist to his business in advertising. Finally, Ricardo will give advice for future photographers and creatives trying to enter the industry. So without further ado, please help me welcome Ricardo. Hey, Ritik, how are you doing? Hey, Ricardo, thank you so much for taking time out to speak to me today about meeting journey. And I'm very excited to have you because I think a lot of people are interested in the world of photography and creative direction, but there seems to be a lot more sort of opaqueness. It's not a very transparent industry in that sense. And, and I'm very excited to get your two cents on it. No, thanks for the invitation. I was very looking forward uh, to talk to you and, and your podcast. Also, thanks for the very flattering um, <laughs> intro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be great. And it's going to be, be, be also insightful for people that want to maybe enter into the industry or just mm -hmm. know a bit more about it. Absolutely. Why don't you explain how you got into the, the fashion photography industry and uh, your data science roots, for example? Yeah, of course. The two things are, I think, deeply rooted in my training. Mm -hmm. um, since I was like in secondary school and then uh, after that, I was very interested in like math and science and physics. But mm -hmm. parallel to that, since I was like also very young, at the same, I was very attracted to like artistic expressions So, in many ways. I liked films. I also liked painting and drawings. Mm -hmm. And I failed experimenting in many artistic fields until eventually I found my way in photography. In, and it's like a discipline in which I feel very comfortable because it combines two worlds. You have to be very technical sometimes, but you also need to be... Uh, creative. So I think uh, photography can be a balance of these two sometimes very opposite uh, sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. I started doing photography at the age of 17, 18. Mm -hmm. My family gave me like a point and shoot camera, which had like no manual uh, mode. It was just point and shoot and it has a flash. And I started photographing a bit of like you know, like very basic landscapes. And then after that, when I started university, I started photographing some pretty girls. And that was uh, pretty exciting. You're completely underselling that, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> for our listeners, what, what had happened was that Ricardo uh, answered the call for an open casting or photography shoot from Guess, which is a massive global fashion brand. And he won that competition. So they flew him out to New York to photograph their models. Is that correct? Yeah, it's pretty accurate. Uh, <laughs> there was, there was a, yeah, like a competition for like upcoming new photography talents and everyone could apply. And among other photographers and creatives, I was selected. And I think at the end, the pictures run in several regions of North America. And that was uh, amazing. Wow. I mean, that's very fascinating. And perhaps you can delve a bit deeper into what, how did you end up at CERN, for example? And at what point did that sort of, you know, the light bulb moment happen where you went like, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to have the confidence to just step into this and do this full time. Um, as I told you, like my artistic influence uh, comes from my mom and mm -hmm. it has been present like my whole life. 
And I think it's kind of like an exponential growth inside me. Like at the start, it was there, it was present, it was parallel, but it start it started like to cook slowly, 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 mm -hmm. until eventually it was like impossible to to ignore it. And I think that turning point came probably in grad school. Mm -hmm. I have to step step back just a bit. Like my original childhood dream was to work like in rocket science, but the path as a Mexican citizen to arrive to a rocket science project it's very very complicated. As you okay. know, probably like for example now SpaceX doesn't allow non U.S. citizens mm -hmm. to work at the company, mm -hmm. and also Europe has uh, similar policies. So in that sense, like politically or uh, paperwork wise was like mm -hmm. very very difficult path to arrive uh, to that place but then i was also very interested in like fundamental physics mm -hmm. and the structure of matter uh, and i pursued that dream and accomplished it by arriving uh, and collaborating uh, at cern mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, precisely when i was at cern i was doing my grad school mm -hmm. I think like it was like the turning point in which I started to consider photography and other creative endeavors more seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I loved uh, my work there and, and the, the spirit of collaboration. But at the same time, I felt that I was like a bit trapped mm -hmm. uh, in such a very, very, very niche place. And not because the kind of uh, research that was uh, going on at that time, which is uh, very interesting, but more because uh, like I felt trapped in the sense that the people that surround me, uh, they have like a, a very like narrow view of life and they, mm -hmm. they are like very talented and very intelligent and they are like amazing colleagues. But at the same time, they didn't know how to appreciate other uh, things uh, about their life. They were like a thousand percent focused on, mm -hmm. on this uh, very small thing. And, and to me, where I come from and how I was uh, educated, yeah, your work is, is a very important part uh, of, your, of your life, but it must not be everything. Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. you are uh, way more than, than your job. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Earlier this year, I went to one of your uh, like landscape exhibitions at the Tequila Museum. And it was amazing. It was brilliant. What are your plans this year? Yeah, uh, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed uh, the show, which we did with uh, much love. If everything goes well with uh, the situation that we are living, uh, my next exhibit about the Mexican landscape is going to be in Museo de la Ciudad de México, wow. uh, the, the Museum of Mexico City in December, which of okay. course you're going to be invited. Perfect. I'm very much looking forward to it. So let's move a bit deeper into your career. As we said in the introduction, you know, you're, you're doing a photography and you're also the founder of own advertising agency called CGTA. So what led to the transition between these two creative fields? Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a transition, but it's more okay. like, a, like an opening to possibilities. Okay. Of course, like my entrance uh, to the creative uh, endeavors is, is photography and is the thing that I, I mostly do is how I represent myself to others and as a, as a fashion photographer, fashion and advertising. Mm -hmm. But after being some years uh, working on, on this industry part-time, or I began to realize that the possibilities in, in, in the creative fields uh, were much more than photography. And this doesn't mean that I need to, to learn many other skills, but yes, to be familiar with and to know how to manage projects that not only involve photography. To start is photography, then graphic and editorial design, and then is copywriting. And then of course, overall is like, how, how do you sell uh, that product? So I started little by little to, to be familiar, not only conceptually, but also with the tools, not to master them, mm -hmm. because I am in the photography side, but to manage them. And <clears throat> sometime, um, after doing uh, photography and learning about all these other fields, a light bulb <laughs> yeah. uh, on, on my brain. And I was like, yes, like photography is amazing. And it's the thing that, uh, that I mostly do, but I think I can like leverage all this training in, in physics and in data science 
can apply it to marketing mm-hmm. and also like to manage all these uh, creative disciplines to build uh, an advertising product. As you know, uh, advertising nowadays has been transformed uh, deeply by, by social media and technology. I think I am very lucky to have been trained in that field and also mm-hmm. liked advertising because I think nowadays it's impossible to unmarry those disciplines. Like, for mm-hmm. example, like many of my clients, they don't only want like, to do the photography and the production and the design. They also, want, they also request like a social media strategy that that not only gave them like more exposure to new potential clients, but to optimize optimize the, the traffic that goes to yeah. the website that sells the product. So it's like the full loop that you have to master nowadays in, in advertising. And I think I am like very familiar uh, with like every single point on on, on that path because of, of my, my training and also because of my passion. So and that's something to, to keep in mind for uh, many people out there that want to do advertising nowadays. It's not, it's not sufficient to know photography or design. Mm-hmm. It's amazing and it's important and it's a pillar of, of, of advertising, but you have to be very sensitive to the business needs. Absolutely. Like maybe you could help me with my podcast advertising as well. <laughs> <laughs> of course, man. So like you touched on earlier, you know, you used your training as data scientist to help optimize your advertising and social media strategy. How? Yeah. So for example, um, like as, as a data scientist, you, you, your job is to discover insights and optimize anything is in front of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it's you know a client's portfolio in finance, or sometimes it's to optimize the traffic to a website. In this case, in advertising, one of like the most common requests from clients and for your own business is to optimize the cost of your advertising campaigns to land new clients. If you okay. have a very expensive product, and let's say uh, you advertise in a neighborhood or in a geographic area which is like low income Mm -hmm. then you are uh, advertising um, in a wrong way okay but not only that you are uh, throwing money to the garbage because you are not getting uh, statistically anything almost from from there right so you have to optimize um, all these variables in such a way that the kind of clients that arrive and request your services can have the means to afford them got it now Perhaps we can draw some parallels. See, a lot of the things you're talking about, you know, as the founder of your business, uh, the need to lower custom acquisition cost, yes. optimizing data, et cetera, sounds a lot like what we do in the startup world, of you course. know? So perhaps you could walk us through some similarities you found having worked in the startup world before as well. Mm-hmm. You know, what are some of the similarities and what are some of the differences that you've seen in photography and advertising business and the startup world? Yeah, of course. Like, first, I'd I like to say that many people, and you mentioned at the start of the podcast, that it's like a not very transparent media mm-hmm. and not many people know how it works. And I don't think photography or adver- advertising necessarily needs to be seen as this like obscure or uh, you know, hard, very hard to get money business from. I think uh, photography and the arts and advertising needs to be seen as any other business. So if you sell food, which is uh, something, quotations, very simple uh, to sell, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the streets of Mexico, your product is, is uh, like very cheap. Mm-hmm. You can start selling the same day, right? Mm-hmm. But in the in the way that your product becomes not necessarily a niche, but more sophisticated, like okay. the amount of clients that you can reach, it comes like less and less. And as a sophisticated business, it, you are not going to start selling the same day as sure. if you sell food, right? So it's like a long-term investment as every like amazing and sophisticated business. So mm-hmm. I, I think uh, this clarification needs to be told, but not many people know how to communicate uh, mm-hmm. this if you are like a talented artist and you trust in, in in your skills it's going to be very hard that you're profitable on on day one 
as sure. if you sell food, right? right? If you start a bank, it's very it's going to be very hard to be profitable day one. Mm -hmm. So I want to to draw this line uh, and and compare uh, advertising and photography to many other industries in, in the sense that if you have like a good and sophisticated product, it's like a long term investment. Yeah. Right. Like for example, that you are very sensitive to these big startups. Like how many mm -hmm. how many years it took Uber uh, uh, to be profitable? I don't think they're profitable. Still. I don't think they're <laughs> profitable still, right? Yeah. So in, in, in that sense, uh, we have to think about uh, other industries, even though we don't have like a nine to five schedule. Sure. Now, maybe I can clarify a bit more, you know, perhaps five to 10 years ago, you know, the, the barrier to entry to the photography or the creative business was much higher. You know, you needed like a very good camera, you needed maybe contacts, etc. Nowadays with the advent of the smartphone, you know, the technology or the, the hardware being much cheaper, anybody could get into it. And sometimes it's just being able to game the algorithm perhaps that gets you viral, gets you noticed. And suddenly you're on the front page either as a model or as a photographer. What really differentiates the photographers who get the million dollar paychecks versus the, the guy who's probably, you know, just in his own bedroom taking these photos, etc., and gets lucky? For to be consistent is one thing that is very important. As mm -hmm. I said before, I was very lucky to be trained in like a science field because mm -hmm. that uh, gives me uh, like lots of grounds in many things, not only about numbers, but also like uh, the constant work and, and things like that. So there are like, uh, as you said, like many photographers or bedroom photographers, mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, that can be, I don't know, popular, but it's very different to, to be popular than dealing with clients. It's a whole different world. Uh, yeah. if, you want, if, you want, if you want to get these million dollar paychecks, which one day I, I aspire to have for working for brands like, I don't know, like Versace uh, yeah. or Dior or Tom Ford. You have to, to have like a, like a track record, not only of producing good work that can be produced by a handful or more uh, photographers, but you also need to be like very consistent, like the delivery times, uh, the contracts, mm. uh, also like how you treat your clients mm -hmm. and what uh, payment uh, methods you offer to them you know it's not only like the quality of work sometimes uh, the quality of, of work is important but there are like many these many other aspects that you have to consider to hire uh, uh, someone and from the other side to, to become successful for example many of my of my clients tell me you know like i did some research I got like quotes from uh, different photographers or advertising agencies. And you know what? Like you were like the most expensive, uh, like double. But right. you know why I picked you? Because every time I or every time I called you or you reply instantly almost. Got and it. that give, gives me a lot of uh, confidence in you and in your business. And mm -hmm. I think my money is uh, very well taken care of. Got it. And perhaps you can expand a bit more on, on the business of advertising. Like, how do you get paid? How do you build your portfolio? Of course, I think uh, for this question, we can start doing photography. So okay. to start doing a photography portfolio, well, of course, you need basic gear, right? Yep. And in my case, which is fashion photography and advertising, you need to start doing collaborations and by doing collaboration, you can uh, showcase uh, your talent and like your areas of expertise that you, you can provide. Mm -hmm. So you contact uh, creatives, let's say I'm a photographer, you contact uh, a model and you propose a, an idea. And mm -hmm. of course, everyone wants to benefit from like a collaborative project. Mm -hmm. uh, you get photos so that you can showcase uh, your skills to clients and the model gets uh, photos, right? This is like a very simple example, mm -hmm. but I think it's illustrative and it, I mean, it shows how, how you can start to build your portfolio. And then it's like a domino effect. Once you start, once you surpass friends and family uh, taking like photos, like for very small projects, mm -hmm. then you, you can, you have like a small portfolio and then 
like your basis, your work basis gets a bit more solid. And from then you can uh, contact other uh, creatives that perhaps they have been in the field more time with more confidence and they may, they may agree to do uh, a collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like your podcast. After that, you realize that photography is not everything in the advertising world. So you have to, to do projects that are not only involve photography, but per, perhaps a collaboration of photography with graphic, de graphic design. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe furthermore, uh, photography with graphic design and a copywriter to do like a full editorial story, right? And doing these uh, bigger collaborations, you not only learn to excel your skills, but you also learn how, how to communicate to, to people, which not every time are like the most uh, easy to easy going. Yeah. Well, one last question I had, uh, you know, a lot more sort of philosophical, you know, a lot of times, especially when you're pursuing the arts, there's a lot of subjectivity and the advice that you tend to get you know, once you use the art as a means to put food on the table, it loses its magic. You know, what are your thoughts about that? I think uh, I'm going to recall like the phrase that uh, I used before, um, mm -hmm. photography and advertising um, needs to be seen as any other uh, business, right? Like finance. Yeah. Once, once uh, your finance or your finance skills put food on your table, it may lose the magic. Well, it's the same in 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 everything in football or in any field or if you're a chef and you have to work for a restaurant what keeps uh, magic is uh, two things one is keep doing collaborations i think especially in creative fields uh, often collaborations give you more clients than your work you did for a past client because you can be more free more creative and more bold Sometimes mm -hmm. or most of the time when you work for clients, especially in Latin America, uh, they come from very um, conservative uh, uh, background. So the image they tend to give, give, to, give to their brands, it's, um, yeah, it's beautiful and it's nice, but these are very conservative. So when you can excel and you can push the boundaries uh, of, of your talent is uh, when doing collaborations. So I think that's something uh, very important that is going to uh, the spark or, or, or the flame going on. Another thing Got is to, to try to get uh, clients that are able to take chances. That's, right. not, that's not trivial, but uh, doing bold work can attract those type of clients. Uh, but sometimes you can slowly push your clients towards things that are more interesting, more bold. So moving on to our next section, payback period. Ricardo, what's your question for me today? Yeah, of course, Vitik. I think we are uh, in some ways like-minded people. Yeah. You have your uh, technical skill, but you also have like your, uh, your creative skill. And I think you're pretty good at it. I have been, <laughs> been lucky to go to, to several uh, shows in which you have uh, uh, like appearances. But, but I want to know when you are going to do like... Um, like a bigger thing, let's say like a one hour comedy special by Ritik. Yeah, that, that's such an interesting question because a lot of people think that, you know, if you can do five minutes, you just need to extrapolate and it'll be one hour, you know? And it, it, it's a question that perhaps a, a creative guy is asking because you understand the differences, perhaps like a sprint versus a marathon within this particular industry. Um, one hour special, like I've done half an hour cell in my body by the end, you know, was, was just screaming because it's exhausting. First of all, it's just to be able to manage the flow, to be able to keep the attention of the audience. Now imagine having to double that to an hour, that would be just exponentially more difficult. It's not a linear, but rather an exponentially harder skill. It's something I'm working on. Uh, and it obviously helps when you have, you know, perhaps two hours of great material that you can bring it down to one hour and be like, I can pick and choose. That's something that I want to work towards. Uh, the recording process as well is very difficult, especially now. I don't think I want to do a one hour special on Zoom. <laughs> It'd be very <laughs> difficult to, to not be able to feel the audience. I think... It starts with making the, the content, experimenting, and then training just like a marathon. So like 
uh, once things start opening again, perhaps, uh, you know, go back, do five minutes, just to sort of shake off the rust then scale that to 10, then scale that to 15, then scale that to 20, maintain at the 30 minute mark, then push myself to 45 and then finally do an hour. You know, thank you for that question. Great question. Before we wrap up, Ricardo, do you have any advice for future photographers or creatives trying to enter the industry? Uh, background in data, in data science, but they do need uh, to develop uh, hard skills. Okay. Uh, because nowadays uh, the field demands it. For example, things about accounting, things about right, uh, right. optimizing your client acquisition uh, fee, payment method, different payment me methods for for your clients. Mm -hmm. um, investigate uh, and collect data of when your advertising for your own business or brand is more effective. That's something that you have to work on, and the only way to get it is to be more flexible and later learn more uh, hard skills like mm -hmm. numbers or basic statistics. Mm -hmm. That's very good advice. Well, Ricardo, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the mm -hmm. podcast. And you know, you give so many great insights to this particular brand of business. I learned a lot as well. Uh, would you like to share your contact information for any listener who wants to get in touch with you? Yeah, of course. Uh, give me a follow on, on Instagram. Sure. Uh, and maybe send also like a message to say hello. Is at I'm going to say it in English in Spanish. It's okay. at region M T. Okay. Region as in R E G I O N M T. Uh, region M T. That's yes. my Instagram handle. And my website is regionmastransparente.com. Got it. Perfect. Well, Ricardo, thank you so much again for taking time out. I hope to speak to you again when uh, you're living in a penthouse in New York after <laughs> making millions just like Tom Ford did. Uh, and, and thank you so much again for your time. Yeah, man, like the sky is the roof and hopefully one day I'll be awarded uh, an Oscar for photography. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you will have a lot of confidence. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Ritik. Bye-bye.